Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast, episode two. Today, we'll be talking about the Inside EVs Mini Cooper SE road trip to the racetrack, Ford files a trademark for faster charge, Missouri offers Tesla a $1 billion package for the Cybertruck Gigafactory, and much, much more. Thanks for joining us. Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast, the weekly podcast from Inside EVs. I'm Dominic Ioni, an Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. This is episode number two. Today we have with us Tom Logney. Uh, Tom Logney, sorry, longtime EV advocate and Inside EVs editor. Uh, we also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily Podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. And last but not least, we have Kyle Connor from the Out of Spec Motor and YouTube channel, uh, and also a host of Inside EVs YouTube. Um, go subscribe. Thank you. How y'all doing this morning? Yeah, really good. All right. Hello. Hey there. So, lots to talk about today. Uh, first off, two of you are kind of in the same sort of area because so. Uh, uh, we have an Inside EVs Mini Cooper SE road trip to the racetrack. And one of you practically lives at a racetrack, and the other one has a Mini Cooper. So, Tom, tell us about your trip a little bit. Sure. So, I um, was scheduled to have a media loan for a Mini Cooper SE. Uh, and uh, uh, during this lockdown, there really isn't a lot for me to do uh, other than really take advantage of the fact that this might be a good time, although that sounds counter counterintuitive, to drive down to the Inside EVs track in North Carolina. I know travel is restricted, but media is an essential service. And during the whole trip I drove down, I didn't come in contact with a single person. Uh, I was used the Electrify America network, uh, got out at every stop with my gloves on and my disinfectant wipes, wiped down the charging station, before I plugged in. Uh, and then when I arrived at uh, Kyle's out of spec track here in North Carolina, it was just me and him <laughs> on um, <laughs> how many acres, Kyle? Yeah, like 680 or so. <laughs> so, you know, it's the two of us. And as you can see, we're in separate screens now because we're in separate rooms. We've been keeping <laughs> our distancing. Um, but we thought it would be a good time uh, in this downtime to really spend some time alone on the track, test out the Mini Cooper SE, do some drag races. Um, and just kind of get some content uh, for inside EVs and for out of spec motoring. And it worked out really well. We, we're, fin we're finished filming. We've got a bunch of videos coming out. We've got drag race videos, driving impression videos, charging videos. So we're going to have a lot coming up on, on inside EVs um, really soon uh, with the Mini Cooper SE. So before, before we get into the track thing, uh, just tell us like how, how far a trip is that and how long did you have to stop at these uh, Electrify America chargers? Sure. So um, it was total 400, and I think 431 miles uh, from northern New Jersey, where I live down here to North Carolina. And I had to stop four times to charge at Electrify America sites. Uh, and it actually went, it was the best experience I've ever had with Electrify America. Uh, that's, if that's an indication of that they're getting better, then that's a good sign. Uh, because in the past, I, we've noted on some of the trips that I've taken, uh, when I'm doing uh, road tests with media cars, I've, I haven't had the best experience in the past in some of my charging with Electrify America. Uh, this time, all four times, plugged in, initiated a charge through the app, didn't try to use the credit card, which sometimes can be wonky, immediately accepted it, started the charge. The charge never shut off during the whole time. It, it just worked perfectly in, in every time that I needed to stop. So the whole trip, uh, 430 something miles. It took me a little over nine hours, I believe. Uh, and with the four stops, each time I stopped between 35 and 40 minutes. Okay. It's not, not completely unreasonable. And what's, what's the range on, on that? Yeah. Mini so EV? that's the interesting thing. One of the reasons why um, we thought it'd be fun to do this is the Mini Cooper SE right now has 110 mile EPA range rating. It's right. the shortest range electric vehicle available in America. So if I could drive from New Jersey to North Carolina on the shortest range electric vehicle, then that says something about where we're coming with the DC fast charge networks. I know Electrify America hasn't 
covered the entire country yet, but the coasts at least are pretty robust. And I can drive uh, up and down the coast from, say, you know, Maine down to Florida uh, with, with any electric vehicle. If I can do it with a Mini Cooper SE, it can be done with any electric vehicle. And that's really good to say that we're, we're, we've gotten to that point right now. So this is like 400 some 400 some miles. It's maybe like a an hour and a half, two hours longer than if you had say like a 300 mile car. Yeah, I guess if I had a 300 mile car, if I had my Tesla Model Three, for instance, I would have stopped once. Okay, so, somewhere in the middle, uh, probably, probably 30 30 minutes. 40 minutes to give it a good good charge. Okay. Instead, I stopped four times for 35 to 40 minutes. So maybe maybe it took me, you know. Uh, two and a half hours more, maybe, maybe two hours more. There's one right. more thing I'd like to add to the trip, which right. was, um, uh, I was with Tom. I, I followed him down in a separate vehicle, uh, for not the whole thing, but about 80% of the trip. But, um, uh, we were really charging the mini pretty deep into the pack and arriving to chargers, not completely dead. Okay. Um, and, and we did a, a test last night from zero to 99% DC fast charging and this thing has a great charging curve. It sits at max speed, 50 kilowatt, basically just under, uh, from zero to 77%. So it's it's almost, there's no incentive to leave before 77%. And um, w by that point, we were just talking and hanging out and, uh, you know, sort of just, you know, spending time there that we didn't feel the need to unplug and stretch it to the next charger, but we could have shaved easily a half hour off that trip. No problem. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's definitely true. And and also because it's the car is new to me, I had just gotten it the day before I started this trip. I didn't want to push the range. Um, so I felt better staying, you know, five or 10 minutes longer at each stop. You know, now maybe on the way home, I'm going to get a little creative and see if I can unplug a little bit quicker and make it to the next uh, station. Mm -hmm. So it should be an interesting drive home. So, um, so it's rated at, what do you say, 110 miles? Yes. And um, so approximately how fast were you driving and what kind of range do you think you were, you were seeing? How close to the EPA estimate? Just okay. real briefly. So we're going to have really comprehensive posts coming up on this. But as, yeah. as an overview, I wasn't driving slowly. When I do range tests, I like to, you know, see what I would get if I own the car. So on the way down here, I was driving anywhere between 70 and 80 miles an hour, a few times for a little while, maybe higher than 80 miles an hour. I, I, I can't really confirm that. Um, and we averaged about four miles per kilowatt hour, which was amazing, even higher. Yeah. So Kyle was resetting his Model 3 performance and I was resetting the efficiency on the Mini and he was driving right behind me the whole way. And our efficiency was exactly the same, which was, nice it kind of blew us both away because we certainly expected the model three to have a better efficiency, but the mini, the mini Cooper SE plowing through the air at 75, 80 miles an hour came up with the same efficiency rating as the model three did. And by the way, he was behind me drafting. So I might've <laughs> actually been doing a little better. Right on. All right. So then you got down to the track and um, so I, know, I know you uh, did some little drag racing with it, but I don't know what do you, what do you want to talk about first, just the general track dynamics. Like, yeah, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, I guess we got like six different videos shot. Yes. I mean, when I mean, Tom and I, we were here at like just before eight o'clock and we did not stop filming till one thirty in the morning. Like we just went the whole day. Like, I don't even think we ate lunch. Maybe. Oh, Alyssa brought in lunch, but um, yeah, I guess we did so much. So Tom, do you want to talk about, I guess, and just take us through the day and sort of everything we accomplished with the car um, and maybe some of the results, but obviously not all because we want people to watch the videos too. Yeah. So, well, I won't do it all. I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit about your time, really thrashing it around the track a little bit. Um, but um, I will talk about what the picture you have up there. Um, that's me with my arms up. Uh, I just stood out there for the photo op because then I hopped in the mini and drove it. Um, we didn't have a crew of people around us to film and do things. So, um, uh, so what we did was, uh, Kyle's girlfriend has a 2016, uh, BMW i3 with range extender. And, uh, we are able to get it to the track, fully charge both vehicles to hundred percent and do some quarter mile runs. Now, 
Um, I really expected the i3 to win. Uh, I had a 2014 BMW i3 with range extender, um, but then more recently for the last two years, I've had a BMW i3 S. Now the Mini Cooper has the same motor as the i3 S. So it has more power than the i3. But just from living with the cars, I really thought the i3 was going to beat it. I'm still convinced my i3 S would beat it handily. But I guess I had forgotten that my old car, because I haven't driven it in three years, um, that, you know, how the power it felt. So I was confident the i3 was going to win. And we lined up and um, wasn't the case. I, 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 I beat the i3 in the Mini Cooper. We did a couple runs and uh, both times and it, it beat it well. It was kind of even pulling on it uh, at the end. So, um, you know, Kyle predicted the Mini was going to win. He was right. Uh, and a little surprising. I still, I wish we had an i3s because I'm, I'm pretty confident that that would have beaten it pretty badly. But uh, in any event, um, it was a fun drag race. Uh, and then we did some more drag races, but I don't know if we want to reveal everything here today. Right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let well, Kyle reveal the drag race. Kyle, talk a little bit about have. your track time with the car. Sure. Just, um, just, just, just before that, I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, the, we do have like a Mini Cooper SE section on the Inside EVs forum, and we have one owner there already who is actually he's a YouTuber, and um, he has a bunch of different owner. He's sharing his ownership experience, and he has a, a few different videos about uh, different aspects of things. So. Definitely go and check that out if you're interested in the Mini Cooper SD. And I believe we have a, a thread there for Tom. He's answering, we'll be, we'll be answering some questions once he gets the chance to set up a computer and take care of that. And yeah, and so go ahead, please, Kyle. Yeah, that, that, uh, that's pretty cool. I want to get in there and uh, I'll answer some questions with Tom sure. too, just, just from a performance standpoint. So I got to um, just open up the Mini around the track, which was great. Uh, a lot of people don't know. I have a mini jacket on now. I'm a mini fan, right? I love these cars. I've owned a whole bunch of them. I like the performance aspects of minis. A lot of people don't realize they're super great handling vehicles. Um, I've spent countless hours on track in minis. Um, John Cooper works to even base Coopers. Uh, uh, so I'm very familiar with the cars, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I um, was really curious about the electric mini. Uh, first thing you notice when you put your foot down is, is gobs of torque, right? It, it goes, um, but you cannot get wheel spin and it's, uh, no front wheel drive burnouts will happen in this car, even if you fully disable traction control. And the reason is, uh, BMW's tuning on the software doesn't allow for any front wheel spin under any circumstance. I mean, you'll get a, maybe a 5% rotation. You can hear the tires work, but I'm pretty sure they're preventing, uh, excessive wheel spin and then it catching back up and snapping an axle, which was a problem on i3s. So they have very conservative tuning uh, around corners. When you accelerate out of corners, it's not even traction control to the limit. It's more the motor controller that's just holding back to stop wheel spin. So that got a little annoying on track. I think it's going to limit some performance in an autocross scenario um, because you, you do want some wheel spin in some cases. It is not as quick as grip, but the car just didn't get back to full power quick enough. So that was a little bit annoying. The chassis itself is amazing when you're driving like six, seven tenths sort of spiritedly on a road. Um, the people who buy these cars really are not going to be tracking them. They may find themselves on a twisty mountain road. It's going to be perfect for that. It'll feel just like a normal mini. But when you drive it a little bit harder, eight, nine, ten tenths past its limit, past the grip of the tires, it sort of falls on its face, unfortunately. And, uh, you really feel the weight of the batteries. It understeers really crazily. I mean, there is, I did some lift off oversteers, just doing anything to try to get some neutral balance out of the car. And it's just so nose heavy. So I was, I was personally disappointed with it on track, but I think we need to realize this car is not made for that at all. <laughs> yeah. uh, the only other problem I ran into on track was similar to I three, which is very quick overheating. So when you run the motor full blast, uh, I don't know if it's software to prevent overheating because it recovers very quickly, uh, but it basically falls on its face and has no acceleration. You let off completely, put it in neutral for like 10 seconds and it's back to full power again. So just interesting okay. software. So not a track car, but you, you could throw some tires on that and, and put it, let it loose in the parking lot for like an autocross event, right? Yeah, I, I actually think with some really grippy rubber and a strong rear sway bar, 
Uh, this thing's going to be an autocross monster, I, probably better than the uh, turbo internal combustion engine cars, um, if you can get that handling balance there. Because the um, unlike Alyssa's i3, probably similar to i3s, when you put your foot down and the car's in sport mode, it gives you the power instantly. I mean, it, it really is immediate. And, and, and one of the things I'd like to bring up, um, well, Kyle just mentioned about sport mode. Some of the uh, electric cars I've driven, you know, have the different driving modes, sport, neutral, comfort, green. The, with the Mini Cooper SE, I, I think the sport mode seems to make a bigger difference than it does in the other EVs that I've driven. It really, there's a huge difference in the, the mid, mid it, it defaults to mid. It's interesting, the Mini has four driving modes, just like the i3S does. Um, and they just give them different names. You know, in the i3S, it was Sport, Comfort, Eco, and Eco Plus. And in the Mini, it's it's um, Sport, Mid, Green, and Green Plus. So, you know, it's the it's same software. They just gave it a different name. But the, the, the difference in Mid to Sport with the Mini Cooper SE is huge. So if you're a fan of driving, you know, aggressively and having fun, when you get in the, the Mini Cooper SE – you definitely want to throw it up into sport because when when you leave it in the mid range, you just don't get that that punch at all. When you step on it, it almost doesn't feel electric carish. That like that throat when it throws you back, it's right. really muted, um, which is fine for everyday driving for a lot of people. You don't need to to have that constant instant torque when you're driving to work in the morning. Yeah, I would agree. I would say um, driving it around town, I shared the opposite experience that I had on track, which was, you know, sunroof open. I was smiling. The music was up. The car was zigging through traffic. Like I, uh, I got in the car, I drove it a mile down to our town here. And I was like, I have to have one of these. It's the perfect. <laughs> like I, I actually even thought to myself, if I had to go run an errand in town, would I drive this or my Tesla Model 3 Performance? And the answer is 100% the Mini every time. Uh, so I, I actually, I, I like driving the Mini more than the Tesla. And, and I can tell you guys one thing. I, I know we have to probably jump over to the next segment. Kyle's not exaggerating. He was like giddy down here. Like, like, like <laughs> you should have seen him when I pulled up with the car, smile ear to ear. I let him drive it for a little bit. He came back and he's like, dude, I have to get one. <laughs> Right. So th that was genuine. He 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 loves this car. <laughs> I, I, I'm I feel a little bit bad. Well, not bad. I just I just feel like because of the range is so much less than what a lot of the other options are out there that it won't really get what the respected deserves in the market. So I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. But I guess we'll we'll see how it goes. And uh, yeah, I guess and they're selling this over in England as well in the UK, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, my experience is the same as. Kyle, I used to own a, a Mini. I used to own a Mini Cooper as oh, well. Not, not, the, not the Cooper S, unfortunately, but the Cooper. And for anyone that hasn't driven one or had the pleasure of being in one, it's a great chassis. And it does feel like you're in a little skateboard. It just is a ton of fun. It's anything but Mini these days. So if you are thinking yeah. Mini and you're thinking of the Italian job and Michael Caine and these yeah. tiny little cars from the 60s, I mean, Mini under BMW is anything but Mini. It's a it's a big car. You'll get a lot in it. Um, it looks smaller because of the, its clever styling, but it's very much a big car. And uh, it's, it's a very practical car as well. My wife and I, pre-family, I must add, pre-DIY, pre-having to go get things from... Uh, the DIY store, uh, but uh, when we were kind of younger and um, and enjoying that lifestyle, it was a great car. We did road trips in it as well, and it's just it was just fun to drive. So I'm super excited about the electric version made in a town called I think they're made I think they're made in um, uh, is it Swindon in the UK? Um, I need to look that up. But the the, the one thing that I was going to ask you guys before we move on is. Having not driven the Mini Electric yet, of course, BMW are using their existing technology in it. So they have their fifth generation electric powertrain and drivetrain technology, which is going to the BMW iX3, the one that's going to be made in China. But they've used their existing tech for this new car. And my worry with the new Mini is when it finally comes out and people are in it, is it going to feel like yesterday's car, yesterday's technology? Because this has been in the BMW i3 for years now. And I sensed some disappointment that they weren't using the latest, greatest tech that they have in BMW's arsenal 
to put inside this great little car. Is that the case, Tom? Did you feel like they're, they're, they're taking some bits from the parts bin and, and putting them inside the Mini, or does it feel like a properly well-put-together current EV? So they did a good job with it with what they used. I, I, I'm i a little torn between this. You know, I drove the Mini E 10, 11 years ago. I, I was in BMW's pilot program, which was an all-electric Mini Cooper. That's kind of how I got into electric cars. And it, it's hard for me to not get out of this car and say, my God, I, I stepped into like a time machine and, you know, I feel like this is my car from 10 years ago. Now, it, it, that said, this car is worlds more advanced than that car 10 years ago. It's, it has active thermal management, has a heat pump. I mean, that car the, the, in the winter, the range literally was 50% of what it was when it was warm. I mean, it took that big of a hit. It went from 110 miles to 50 miles. Um, so, I mean, it was a crude electric vehicle, but overall, it, it driving it and everything, it doesn't feel like the vehicle has advanced in a decade. So in that regard, it is disappointing to me. But will other people realize that? I don't know. I, I, I think a lot of people that are getting in this car, Martin, are going to be first time mm. EVers. And it's it's almost like they don't know what they're missing or they don't know what you know, the fifth generation uh, BMW <laughs> is going to be like. So it's a great driving experience and it can rest on that. Um, but for experienced EV people that have driven the cars might say, geez, you know, it does feel like I stepped out of something from, you know, five years ago, but you know what? Five years ago was still good. So, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, I, I, it's hard for me to, to really verbalize that feeling. Um, but like I said, yeah, it, it does feel like we stuck in a little bit of a time machine. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people actually like that aspect of it because it speaks of reliability. All the bugs have been worked out in the i3, so put it in this thing, and you know, there's uh, just the size of the, the the range. You know, it's it'll feel pretty modern to anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what else is going on in the, in the world of electric vehicles? Well. Your Tesla free supercharging miles, use them or lose them. Tom, you were about this this week, um, I guess. So if you get a referral, you get free supercharging miles. And sure. Yeah. You don't keep them forever. Yeah. So um, interesting thing happened this week. I've I've had my Model Three for like ten months now, and Tesla keeps changing how the referral system works. I don't want to get into that. We could do a whole show on it. But when <laughs> when I when I first got my Tesla. You got 5,000 free supercharging miles if you, you had a referral code. I did. A friend of mine gave me his referral code. So I started off with 5,000 free supercharging miles. Since then, I've had nine referrals. Then right after I got my car, Tesla lowered it to 1,000 miles. So um, I would have 9,000 more miles, which would take me up to 14,000. But for a brief period of time, they were giving 2,000 miles, and I had one referral in that. So get past that, I had 15,000 free supercharging miles. And uh, I've gradually used only like 900 of the miles. I don't supercharge much. I don't need to. I charge at home. Um, and then, so I had a little over 14,000 supercharger miles left. Uh, and then I looked at my app and all of a sudden it said 10,000 miles. So overnight, Tesla wiped off a little more than 4,000 of the supercharger miles. And I couldn't really figure out why. It didn't make sense. Tesla says that they'll remove the supercharging miles after six months. Uh, after uh, after six months, you only get to use them for six months. But there was some confusion over well, if you get another referral during that six month period, does that um, continue over? I think we just lost some just power. Just wave your arm for a second; it'll kick back on. <laughs> <laughs> the lights shut off after one hour in that room. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> For those who are not on video, we right. turn on. the lights off on Tom. Yeah, it's, it's so a motion. I'm going to run over and turn the lights on. Yeah, just if once you get up and it sees your motion, it'll turn back on. Nice. Right. There you go. So sorry about that, folks. So anyway, um, so then, so I wrote an article on it uh, on like you know we're kind of confused about how does this work? How, how does how exactly does the supercharger? miles work and why weren't how come we, i didn't get notified i just lost four thousand miles overnight and we found out that a lot of our readers were emailing and saying the same thing commenting so tesla did like a purge 
sometime at the beginning of, of this week and wiped off a lot of people's supercharger miles all at once. And kind of an odd time to do it now during this whole coronavirus shutdown where people aren't driving. A lot of the other networks and, and, and companies and other businesses are extending things, not ending you know programs like this. So it was kind of weird timing. So we wrote the article and said, look, um, just to make these, you know, Tesla owners aware, you know, that you don't get to keep these forever because a lot of people didn't realize that they expire. So use them or you lose them. Um, so the interesting thing was then two days later, oh, and one of the things we recommended was like, look, there should be some kind of way that we know when they expire. Cause I had no idea that it was going to just get wiped off overnight. Right. And all of a sudden Tesla updated their app all to now tell you when your supercharger miles expire. And it was, you know, two days after we did our article. So it's kind of interesting timing. It begs to, to, to make us wonder, did they, did they do that because they, they read our, our article? Um, so the, the other interesting thing was, so I sent Tesla media a question to please clarify this. They never respond to me. Um, so I wasn't expecting that, but I also called customer service, spoke with the person at Tesla customer service, she, very nice. But she said, listen, I can't answer this. I don't know how the referral system works. I don't know how your supercharger mile works. Um, none of us here at customer service knows that we'll have to put this into a, a, like a supercharging expert and they'll email you, give me your email address. So I can't, couldn't speak to the person. They have to email me. So I gave them all my account information. And two days later, yesterday, I get an email that says, you know, thank you for inquiring about your supercharger miles. We looked up your account and we see here that all of your miles are expired from now forward. You have to pay to use supercharger. But my app still says I have 10,000 supercharging miles. And those are referrals that I've had within the last six months. So they shouldn't wipe off. Right. So I don't know what to think now. You know, <laughs> I'm looking at you another email. <laughs> I, I'm going to follow up. I was busy here all day with Kyle, as we mentioned on the track. I really didn't have time to, to do that, but I'm going to send another email back and say, hey, you know, with a screenshot of my miles and say, you know, what's going on here? Though just the weird thing is I lost all those miles in one chunk. It wasn't in like every six months period. It made no sense. It was like, right. you know, and, and that's a confusing thing. Like, God, we love Teslas. I love my car. But th this is the kind of stuff that the company does that drives people crazy. Right. And it's almost like that sort of a referral or that sort of deadline kind of encourages people to drive or you know, I don't see the point of it, like encouraging people to drive more than they maybe need or use superchargers more than they need. You know, I, I I don't like free supercharging. I don't like free charging on any network. I know manufacturers use it. A lot of manufacturers are partnering with Electrify America now and offering two years free unlimited charging. You know, when, when you buy the new car uh, and, and Tesla has been doing this free supercharging, as a general rule, I don't like it. I know it works and it helps as an incentive to sell the cars, but it really makes people abuse that service. The, it, it, people use, I know people that exclusively charge on superchargers because they have free unlimited charging and they could charge at home, but why should they? They're getting it free from, from, from Tesla. And what that, all that does is it can, it, it makes the superchargers less accessible to, for people that really need them. Right. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I, I haven't used them. I had 15,000 miles. Like I said, I, I have um, almost 15,000 miles on my car now, and I had 15,000 supercharger miles. I could have basically exclusively charged at superchargers, but I've used like 900 of the miles because I only use it when I need to, when I'm on long trips. Uh, right. And I, I just think that it's a bad policy, and I wish all electric car manufacturers would stop this free charging stuff because it, it just clogs up the stations and it makes them less accessible for people that really need them. And, and for most of us charging the home is, it's pretty cheap anyway. So it's not even that. Exactly. Yeah. So, we had, a, we had a, a similar thing happen here with one of the early networks, the first ones to go into the, the motorway service stations, a network called Ecotricity. And yeah. for many years they were free and eventually they had to put the price on. So when they put a price on it and, started charging there was outrage and people couldn't get their head around it because for years they've been used to free charging uh, when they're on a long road trip and they pop into the motorway services they've been used to just uh and uh, plugging in for free and so they they had to go back and forth a couple of times and get the pricing right and that just looks like they're 
dithering and they don't know what to do. And then there was lots of negative sentiment online about them. They haven't got the best hardware either. Well, they've got some very right. old hardware. So by now it's starting to really strain and, you know, it needs more maintenance, but that's a different issue. And so, of course, people then think very negatively of a company that were the very first ones to invest loads of money into all of these fast chargers alongside Nissan as well. It was a joint project, but 50 kilowatt Chadamo and CCS fast chargers on all the main routes. And it was free for years. And they should never, ever have done that. They should have said to people, you can charge at home, but when you are needing to fast charge, then here's a fair price to pay for electricity. And then it would have just it never would have got to that. This whole launching and some some charging networks launch and they did like first month free. And I get that, but you wouldn't expect it with petrol and diesel. You don't get a new petrol station opening and they're like, hey guys, first month free. So why do it with electricity? I'm I'm with Tom. It's a massive mistake to do anything for free. And it also it devalues what is this is, is something essential for the you know for the car when you're on a long road trip these things should be seen as prized fast chargers in in good locations and are worth paying for and supporting these companies that have got a big outlay at the beginning rather than it being seen as a as a right yeah it's one of the big customer experience problems with electrify america here in the us they put in these massive beautiful 350 kilowatt stations battery storage it, it easily costs more than a million dollars per site in some locations wow. and um you know they're basically clients that say i can't believe i have to pay eight to ten dollars to fill up well here's the thing like you charge at home 99 percent of the time you go on a trip once a year sure it's going to cost you but think about how much money this company just spent to put in this station and yeah. um you know i even feel it too like i have free supercharging on my tesla um and and i don't even use my the referral miles they just add up because my car is two years for free um not that i ever go to the supercharger and charge instead of home i charge at home pretty much exclusively but if i need to go to target maybe i just go to the target at the supercharger and get some free juice that's how I do it. And it right. abuses the network. I mean, if it's anywhere near full, I won't plug in. I park next to it. But, you know, you get what I'm saying. It's a perk that people will abuse. It puts a strain on the network, like you said. And also, these superchargers need maintenance. So the more charging cycles they have, uh, the more maintenance they're going to need and the slower they get over time. So so speaking of uh, supercharging, okay, this is the worst segue ever, but uh, so the, uh, the Tesla Cybertruck, uh, is is coming at some point, and we don't know where it's going to be built. And um, but Missouri it wants the, wants the factory that's that's going to build it another gigafactory. So uh, they've held out a package of like a billion dollars um, to kind of try to lure the cyber truck production to that state. Um, you've heard a bit, bit about this, Martin. Uh, you got some details for us. Yeah, a billion dollars is a is a lot of money. So how is that made up? Well, it's made up from some land over it's over a hundred acres, maybe even more, of land that will be sold to Tesla at a discounted rate, the fifty percent off. Also, it's tax breaks. It was something like ten or twelve years of tax breaks if they come and trade here. Now, of course, all of these places that have engineering colleges or universities. They all want to compete for any big company, any big tech company, but especially a company like Tesla, where some of the estimates that I read this week could add six to 7,000 jobs with a gigafactory. Um, although, I don't know, I mean, gigafactory is meant to refer to the kind of gigawatts, hours of batteries coming out. So I don't know if we call a, a factory making only a car a gigafactory, oh, or maybe this a, will we have a battery a, a, production. Right, sorry. I think it, Musk has said in the past, uh, Elon Musk, uh, Tesla CEO, has said that all the gigafactories will have a battery component to them. So kind of I assume that will be the case in the, in the cyber, giga cyber, but I guess that remains to be seen. But yeah, like you say, they weren't, Missouri wasn't throwing like a billion dollars at them and saying here, it's, <laughs> like, it's a, a deal on land and the tax breaks for over like a long period of time. So they have to perform over a period of time in order to realize, yeah. realize that benefit. So there you go, like 12-year tax break. And, you know, for any any kind of incentive, is going to be very attractive to Tesla, who, despite all of the hype and the money, they still need these these kind of things. And places 
I mean, we don't we don't really know what happens behind the scenes, but from all accounts, there was a a, a bidding war, or at least a very competitive bidding war in Europe between not only different countries, but regions within countries. Right. And and again, what the Berlin region, although the Berlin Gigafactory is quite a long way outside of Berlin, but uh, we'll call it Berlin, uh, Giga Berlin, it again had to offer a, a set of attractive incentives to get Tesla to the area. And I do understand why as well, because if you have that kind of hub of manufacturing, you hope that what will spring up around it is a bunch of other complementary industries and services as well. So it is worth a huge amount of money to these areas. Not the last one that we've we've seen of this. I'm surprised they've gone public with it. But as always, these things play out on Twitter, as you can see on screen. And so that seems to be the way that Elon Musk likes to do business these days. So, right. yeah. My take on this is that Tesla already knows where they want to be. And they're just, this is let, let the bidding begin. And they're going to use one state against another state and try to get the best deal they can on the site that they've already zeroed in on. And that's why you're going to see it in the news when a new, when, an, when another offer is made, why this isn't kept quiet, because it's all, you know, it's all in their plan to use one state against another to just keep pushing up that price, squeeze out as much as they can. And in, uh, you know, in, in any e economy, Tesla would be, you know, a very hot commodity that you'd, you'd see a lot of bidding, but coming out of, the situation that we're going to be in now, once this the the the, the COVID nineteen crisis settles down and we kind of get back to work, work states are going to be in an even greater, um, you know, uh, does have a greater desire to woo companies for coming in, and you get a Tesla like that that can bring thousands of jobs. Uh, I I I think that this the uh, th this crisis is actually going to drive up the bidding. For Tesla, and th and they're going to get even a better deal than th than they would have if uh, if we didn't have to go through this uh, unfortunate uh, crisis. There were some rumors earlier that uh, I saw. There's a couple of tweets went out that were that disappeared after a while. That uh, that Tesla was going to build a uh, the thing in Texas, which kind of makes sense because Texas is all about pickup trucks. But they, there was a they were saying that just north of of, of Austin, Texas, they had a site chosen. But I went and looked through the public records there. I couldn't find any any record of Tesla having any land purchases in that area. But, uh, but speaking of gigafactories, so uh, Elon Musk was on the Third Row podcast earlier this week, and he was and he tweeted out about this as well that the Giga Berlin will have the world's most advanced paint factory ever, which is kind of which is great, I guess, if it if it works out because Tesla gets some gets knocked for their paint quality at times. It's uh, said to be inconsistent, so they're making they want to make some sort of uh, world class paint shop and be able to give like a like shape shifting paint jobs. You know about this, uh, Kyle? Have you heard about this at all? Yeah, I heard about it. I think I think what Elon's referring to is they just want to up the quality of the paint to maybe some pearlescence. Uh, a few things like this. I think um, uh, the let. I think we can all kind of agree that every color on a Tesla sucks. I mean, at least I think so. Uh, I I don't really particularly like any of them. So uh, it's I, palette, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's boring. I mean, you get basically it, five shades of gray and red. I mean, you know, it's all pretty boring. So it, it definitely is needed. Look at how many Tesla owners wrap their car different colors. There's a market there. And for each one of these people wrapping their cards, you know, five to seven grand that they're never going to get back resale. I mean, they're putting that there just for their ownership to look cool. And then right. it, it doesn't add any value. So this will potentially uh, increase some resale slightly or, or things like this. And uh, I wonder if they'll have a paint to sample. Like if you order a Porsche or a, a BMW with BMW individual, you can literally send them a swab of any color and they'll paint your car in that color. Really? It's like an extra, you know, five grand. Uh, but it's it's usually cheaper than wrapping and uh, much better quality than a wrap look. So we'll see if they do that. Five grand sounds really reasonable for a custom color. Mm. Yeah, wow. I think Porsche paint to samples five thousand exactly. Wow, <laughs> that's uh, that's kind of bizarre. So so Tesla will have like the world's most advanced paint 
on, on a car possibly. And then well, if, if it's, the world, it's definitely going to be Tesla's most advanced. That's pure. That's just pure showmanship. That is rather than right. saying, uh, Hey, we're going to fix it or you're going to be, really delighted with this solution we've got he can't say that he's got to say uh, this is and i hate to compare him to, to trump and i'm sure i'm just gonna annoy uh, uh, thousands of viewers and listeners right now but their their mo if you like really is pro massively promise and then work out how to deliver it and actually that but that's what their fans uh, you know politics aside and whether you like elon or not aside that's that's the way that both of them go about their business, right? And that's yeah, the way we'll Elon like, self-driving across like, the country in like, two yeah. years ago, right? Yeah. right? By the end of by the end of twenty eighteen, we'll go from yeah, LA yeah. to New York, and 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 what are we now? So, it's and that's fine. That's fine because I used to I had a boss that was never as extreme as Elon, but he would always say to us, "Look, I'm going to set some really big targets, and if you right. get ninety percent of the way there, we're still going to get further than if we set a soft target and hit it by hundred percent." So, I have some sympathy for that view. Oh no, it's, it's a great, it's a great, you know, in many respects, it's a good MO and it's what a lot of Silicon Valley people do. You know, they, they have an idea, they don't have it worked out exactly how they're going to do it, but, you know, they throw it out there, get, try to get the money in and try to make it work. And, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes not so much. But, uh, you know, Tesla does, you know, they don't hit every target, but they do, they've done a lot. You, you can't say, you know, they've pioneered a, a whole market segment practically. Um, not, it's totally on their own, but you know they have the they have the, the top product in, in so many respects. Um, yeah, so they're going to have like so. Assuming they it works out, they'll have great paint on like almost all of their cars. It, then they'll have also have this other product, the Cybertruck, with no paint. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're, we're talking about that this week on, online on the, on our in, Inside EVs uh, chat. And we we're just talking about the, all the um, the wrapping possibilities for Cybertruck. We've already seen a lot of uh, mm. renderings online with you know, different wraps. Cybertruck. Would you uh, would you wrap yours, or would you keep your Cybertruck playing the stainless steel? Martin. Or, yeah. Oh, I, I'm not in the market for a Cybertruck. Have you seen the roads here in England? I mean, a Model a X is too right? big. But a Model X is too big. I mean, a Model S is fine if you're on the motorways. So I'm exaggerating, of course. But there are very, very big differences between the kind of places where the Cybertruck is going to be um, uh, popular and the kind of streets that we want to be driving down. I mean, if you're on a back road in a country lane going through some English villages and you come across the cyber truck you're gonna to want to get out of the way pretty pretty quickly that's you know it's big that's why trucks aren't really right. a big thing here as well we haven't got the room um for them so I'm really interested actually it's a really interesting point maybe not for today but a good talking point is to look at those places where the cyber truck is gonna be popular and what people want from them I mean are people just gonna be happy with the stock you, you know kind of out of the factory or are people going to want to wrap them and and make them theirs as well it's a you know fascinating thing to, to talk about but i'm definitely i've got friends that have got their deposit down oh. for their cyber truck uh okay. and they you know they can't wait for a right hand drive version In to be UK. made they yeah going to be waiting a long time uh, yeah. <laughs> for a right hand drive version of the cyber truck so they're excited and they're they're, they're pumped because they're going to use them for for work and home but I'm not in the market for one. I, I got I got nowhere to put it. I think I think it might work well in, in Australia, which is another right hand market. Because uh, yeah, you know, and, and where and you know will they will they only make Cybertruck in in that one location in the new the new Cybertruck Gigafactory wherever it may be? Are they only going to make them there and then start shipping? Elon's talked in the past how it only makes sense to make the vehicles on the at least on the continent at which they're being sold. So then you're talking about if I want a Cybertruck here getting one from Germany. Are they going to start making them in, in Giga Berlin? We know Model Y is where it starts. About a year away is the latest we hear for the opening of that factory. So I can't see them making Cybertrucks anytime soon in Germany. It's a long... Uh, Right-hand drive versions are going to be a long way off. Yeah. But uh, one place that is um, producing vehicles now is China, the uh, China Giga factory. Uh, apparently, they've seen um, their... their See, Model 3 sales in China surged to roughly 12,000 in March of 2020. And mm -hmm. those, are, those are now made in China uh, Model 3s, right? 
And you know, we, have, we have several articles on this Chinese Tesla Model 3 orders skyrocket 10 orders in a minute. Can you talk to that just briefly, Tom? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we I, I got that information from the website uh, Tasmanian. Sent, right. sent me uh, that. It was kind of like a screenshot that they got from a friend of theirs in China that I think works for Tesla and showed an internal um, document that in one minute they got 10 orders and, you know, that, that you know, they're just getting thousands of orders, uh, you know, a, a week, which is really, really great. Great news for Tesla, especially given the, the current situation. I think we're all kind of waiting to see what effect globally the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis has on the world. Uh, you know, we know, I mean, I know here in the U S I know of two people that canceled their Tesla model Y that they had a deposit on and ordered yeah. because of this crisis and the, their economic uncertainty moving forward. So, uh, to see that over in China, people are just still buying these as fast as they can. It's promising because, you know, China's a little bit ahead of the world on this. They got it first. They kind of seem to be over that, the, the major, um, curve of of the problem, although we don't really know because it's hard to get real accurate information out of China. Um, they're not the most forthcoming, uh, but it appears as though that they're 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 beyond that 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 real crisis point point. Um, so if if their kind of economy kind of picks up and takes off, that is a good indication that perhaps it's going to happen for us also. But it's it's still so early to tell. But for now, yeah, that's really super news. Um, that their the model threes are seem like they're getting orders is is coming in as, as fast as they can accept them, which is super news for Tesla. Yeah, the, the pandemic's really hit auto sales like across across the, the, the world actually, and, the, and a lot of a lot of plugins are doing pretty good now. Actually, compared in Europe, a lot of the uh, a lot of different countries reporting this week uh, on inside EVs, uh, a lot of their EVs year over year. Uh, sales are up for plugins because a lot of it to do with the uh, with the uh, legislation in, in Europe for 2020. Um, yeah, so this is promising. I guess uh, in China, the new energy vehicle sales in March show some signs of recovery. So they're up there. They're approaching. They're now just approaching last year's levels. So they've definitely taken a hit, but they're you know there's there is some recovery there, and. Uh, Speaking of that, Byton had shut down. They had started some production of their uh, M Byte. Uh, we were um, thinking it was possibly pre production vehicles they were making back in October, and they, they shut that down, but they're now back up and going. They have deliveries planned for China in, in mid 2020 this year. That's coming to the US and Europe in, in 2021. And uh, that was a really popular vehicle at CES, actually. And you, you drove this thing too, to, right, Tom? Yeah. So, uh, and I've been over to Nanjing to uh, uh, Byton's factory. So, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like uh, Tesla, how it, it amazed me how quickly they built it. Cause I was there a few times and it seemed like I came back a couple months later and like it was built. It was just amazing. Um, and so uh, they didn't quite do it as quickly as Tesla did, but, but almost as quickly. And it was funny. We were talking about the paint in the Tesla Berlin, one of the things that uh, Byton told me when I was there was that they had the most advanced paint shop in the world and that um, it, they actually have given tours from executives of auto uh, manufacturers from around the world, European manufacturers, American manufacturers. They brought them in to show them, to like show them what they've done with their uh, um, paint facility there. So they, they made that claim that they have the most advanced painting facility in the world. And um, maybe Tesla will now be the most advanced more than Byton. But uh, um, I, I thought that was interesting that, that Tesla made that. And I had just heard that a few months ago. So yeah, the, the M-Byte is going to launch. Um, some, it was planned on launch sometime um, the middle to, uh, of the middle towards the end of, of this year. Who knows what this shutdown means as far as if 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 they're gonna you know push that back a couple months now or not, but the vehicle I drove seemed like it was production ready, and that was at CES in uh you know Jan in this past January. Right. So you know I, the, it, it's actually a really interesting vehicle. Uh, it's not uh, Byton has made it for uh, luxury more than for performance. I mean, it moves. It's not like it's gonna go zero to sixty in ten seconds. I don't have the exact time, but I, I guess it's somewhere in the sevens. 
Um, it, it gets out of its way. It, it drives nice, but the Chinese market is much more focused on comfort and luxury than they are performance. And um, I, I think it's going to do really well there. I think people will be interested in it in here in Europe too. Um, it's going to be interested mm. to see how people feel about that giant screen. Uh, hmm. It's really cool. It's not as distracting as people think it is. I know everybody comments, my God, that must be so distracting. I've driven the car. I've sat in the car. When it's on yeah. display at all of these shows, they have the brightness set to like the highest brightness because they want it to stand out. But when you drive it, right. it auto dims down and all of that content is static while you're driving. You don't have things going on and videos and waves to distract you. It kind of just looks like a dashboard with a giant uh, GPS. Like you can have half the screen a GPS, which is really cool. You think the GPS is large on uh, the mapping is large on like the Model 3. Geez, it's it's like three times as big on the bike. You can see everything. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's, it's really cool. Um, and I mean, I'm, uh, it, the, 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 the whole screen wasn't fully functional when I was driving it. I'm hope, hopeful to get in one soon with a fully functioning screen. So we could really see how the content all pulls up. Everything's voice activated. You've got some, uh, some hand signals too, to lower the radio, to raise it, to change channels. I mean, it's, it's got some really cool features that I think people are going to appreciate, but it's, it's definitely something that, I'm curious to see how the American and European reaction is to that giant screen. I, I know they're going to embrace it in China, but it's it might be something that scares people off here in 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 uh, the U.S. and Europe. But um, we'll see. I think it depends as well on on who leads the conversation of what's in, important in a car. And at the minute, I think Tesla have done a really good job of leading the conversation of defining an ev as being quick in a straight line naught to 60 ludicrous mode and the topics of conversation really have been a result of tesla defining the conversation of that's what's important but many people don't realize as you say tom that doesn't get discussed in china i mean it's it's on the spec sheet somewhere but the whole naught to 60 quarter mile top speed that's uh, that is it's not an afterthought, but it's very much further down the priority list. The things that are very, very important, like you say, are connected cars and connectivity with your life and the voice apps that you use already and the ability for it to integrate into your smart home and your smart life and those connected services that are going to make your life easy and comfortable. And even things like, you know, Tesla, I got their bioweapon defense mode and that you know you kind of almost uh, rice smile whenever you know you hear that but actually in china you can spec on cars really high grade filters things like that because of the pollution levels very very important so i think it's the job of the chinese uh, automakers and also companies like biden if they want to start selling their cars in europe and america as well they have to start redefining the conversation to say this is what is great about a connected EV. And I think it's where they've got it wrong with companies with uh, the Mercedes-Benz EQC and the Jaguar I-Pace and the Audi e-tron 55. These are supremely luxury cars, finished, I hate to say it, much better than a, a, an equivalent Tesla Model X because they've got different attributes. But if you were to read online articles and forums and you know you go on Reddit and see what people are talking about, you'd think these cars are terrible because they're like, hang on a minute, it's the same price and Tesla goes not to 60 quicker. And like, that's not the only important thing in the world. But fair play to Tesla. They've defined the conversation of what makes a good EV. How quick can you get to 60? Right, we win. End of conversation. And so these Chinese makers have Got to reframe it. The German ones have got to as well. Good point. Yeah. And also how far it goes, Martin. Right. Because oh, yeah. How far it goes and how fast it goes to 60. Range is important, <laughs> but, it, but people it's are. It's not the only thing. It's not the right. only thing. Right. If not, fast charging is like arguably just more important. You, you, a lot of people will, will yeah. argue. And speaking yeah. of fast store, Ford. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> That's a terrible uh, name. Carry on, Dominic. Carry on. Fast door. Um, so they've filed a trademark for uh, maybe a fast charge network called Fast Door Charge, spelled F A S T O R instead of E R. I don't know what's up with that. And they have a nice fancy like a uh, script to go along with that. 
Um, so do automakers need their own supercharged network? Is this they've already partnered with with Electrify America, Ford has, and then with Ionity in Europe. So, but do they, do they need their own branded uh, network? I mean, look at the logo uh, as well. That's terrible. I mean, that's. I Everything hope this is just something this that was is bad. <laughs> I mean, I, you I know what? I, all I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping that it's just uh, a an app or some sort of service rather than a supercharging network because that's going to be if they are thinking of building their own charging network. That's they need a new name for it. So I'm hoping that fast store. It's terrible, isn't it? Fast oh, store yeah. charge is uh, yeah. is just some sort of billing app thing that brings together electrify america maybe some ford ones as well i don't know in, into one place but i mean could ford build their own supercharging network i suppose they could if they wanted more plugs is not a bad thing i don't think we should discourage more charging points um however i i don't see the need they've already like you had mentioned partnered with electrify america now if you look at uh we just had a screenshot of it up before but it, it's the description of i guess the patent filed yeah it just says electric uh plugs it doesn't say dc or ac specific so this could be ford's destination charging program uh it, it you know, I don't know. Fast or such a Ford thing. They always have these funny names for stuff. So that's not surprising. I just think it's a little cringy. Um, but yeah, I, I I don't think we should discourage more plugs, but I think uh, they should be very careful if they are making their own network to make sure it integrates nicely with existing services um, because activation across many different networks is something that is a, is a big problem. I just did a video on this for Inside EVs. Um, I went around to all the major DC charging providers on the East coast, at least. And it's like, you need this app to activate this one. You need this one to activate that one. And then, oh, by the way, the, the Tesla just does it all by itself. But granted it, it's hard to do that with a legacy automaker or third party because there's mm. no vertical integration. Um, I'd be really curious to see one of the many, uh, charging pooling companies that basically say we are the one service and you can use everything. Uh, each one that I've spoken to so far, it's like, you can use everything, but right. a few. And I'm yeah. just like, well, let's just have one that does it all, but that's going to be so difficult. So we're already in this mess right now. Is it going to get worse or will it get better over time? I'm not sure. Yeah. That was um, one of the things to, uh, to come back to China that uh, we didn't mention on the, on the, the, dis the previous discussion in China, they look at, us and and europe charging and scratch their heads and i've got a pal who works at a chinese car company and he says to me what are you doing like in china you just whatever car you've got whatever charging network you've got they just turn up and plug in because i mean i know that we've got other we've got standards like plug and charge which is a a standard that is 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 here now and will come more but that happens already in china regardless of network regardless of ev and so they they can't understand the land grab that's happened in North America and if I, on, all over in Europe as well, where everybody wants their own network. And because of that, everyone's been siloed as well. So if we can unpick the damage that's been done, it'll make all our lives a lot easier. We need one app to rule them all, basically. Yeah, well, China's a totalitarian state and they can just well, helps. Say, everyone has to use this. Um, even if you've got, 10,000 cars on the road now you've got to pull them all off and retrofit them because this is the plug you're going to use you know we we can't we can't do that in europe and and in the u.s and i'm glad we can't um and and it, it does it make charging more difficult absolutely but um you know it's 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 hard to really compare us to mm. to, to china in that regard and but yeah it does work like like you mentioned and, you know as far as ford i i didn't comment on that before I can't imagine that they're going to try to do their own network. Um, I, I think it could be a combination of both what both Martin and, and Kyle said that, you know, it's, it's more of like a, a, an app or a charging service and perhaps with um, their destination chargers, maybe, you know, they're going to have those, um, those supercharger knockoffs. I don't know if you saw those, those units, um, they introduced them at CES It kind of, it looked like a, a Tesla supercharger with a Ford logo on it. That was a level two charger, by the way. It's not a DC fast charger. And those are what are going to be at all the Ford dealerships, the public facing ones out in the parking lot. So perhaps that's what they're going to call that network that they have around all uh, at all their dealerships. 
Maybe they're going to sprinkle some at destinations too. And then they're going to use their, 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 uh, you know, their app, their service to tie everything together. But I can't imagine that they would want to take on the, 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 the project of trying to install like a DC fast charge network. I don't see why they would do it. And I just, uh, I would, I'll be shocked if, if that's what this turns out to Tesla had to do it 10 years ago. They had to, um, uh, manufacturers don't have to do it now because the infrastructure is getting in place at a incredibly rapid pace. And that's only going to pick up. Why would any OEM want to met, will have to deal with the tremendous amount of work of site location, permitting, construction, then managing it, dealing with demand charges, you know, negotiating contracts with thousands, there I go again, thousands of <laughs> <laughs> thousands of, of different utilities in America. Yeah, there's the screenshot. <laughs> um, you know, supercharger envy, maybe. <laughs> um, and, and that's a level two charger, like I said. So, um, you know, I can't imagine this. I, I mean, I, I will be flabbergasted if this turns out to being like, yeah, we're going to do our own DC fast charge network. I will be shocked. Yeah, it seems a little bit unlikely, but yeah, but you know, there's a trademark. So, but yeah, destination chargers, I think is a, a great opportunity because there's low cost installations and it really helps people out. And it's like a, such an opportunity to brand. Exactly. In, in, in places, you know, where, where you don't traditionally have your brand. Mm -hmm. and, but and just, don't forget, anyone will probably be able to use them though. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. ours, you know, unless it's networked and you need to, uh, you know, put in your, your code or, you know, uh, um, you know, that, you know, do, do, do they want to get walk down that road where they're investing, you know, tens of millions of dollars and then their Ford customers roll up and they're all, they're plugged in. All other vehicles are plugged into them. Right. Mm. That's, that's the point. But if you're at like a, yeah, there's still some work, I guess, to be done on like, say if you have a, a charger at a hotel and you book a room, you can book the charger space at, at that same time. It's like, it's just so some opportunity there for things to be made a little bit more smooth. So you mentioned that last night I charged my mini Cooper SE at a Tesla destination charger at my hotel here. So <laughs> there's, there's a perfect example. Uh, I use Tesla's equipment uh, to charge my mini Cooper SE. And you have an adapter for that? Yeah. Okay. And I guess anybody with a with a J seventeen seventy two would need an adapter to use the Tesla's uh, destination charger. Exactly, they're a couple couple hundred bucks. You can buy them from a couple different um, uh, sites uh, online. So a company I bought mine from is Quick Charge Power. Give them a little plug. They make good good uh, good equipment. Give them a little plug. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, so Tesla does actually, that's one of, one of their things, besides their supercharging network, they do have a lot of des destination chargers in place. So, um, yeah. But we're, we're up against the clock, gentlemen. It's, uh, well, look at that. We've done an hour. Wow, that flew by. Like uh, twice as long as I, I really meant it to go. <laughs> but, um, but I'd like to thank you all for, for joining me today on the uh, Inside EVs podcast. And uh, so, Martin, we can see you every day on, on different podcast platforms that EV News Daily podcast. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, you, you can't see me. I don't like. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I have a face for radio, so I uh, I stick to podcast wherever I can. Uh, yeah, evnewsdaily.com is my little WordPress blog. But every day, seven days a week, I'm podcasting about uh, the latest in the world of EV. So if you were on uh, Apple, Google, Spotify, just search EV News Daily, and you'll find me. And actually, we're on some of those platforms now too. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you can now you can go to Spotify. And I believe Apple has this as well. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, we're on all the uh, the Inside EVs podcast. This is only, for anyone watching this one that doesn't know, this is only episode two. And uh, we, last week, just takes a while to get through to all the various platforms. So, yeah, we're on all the all the places that you can get your favorite podcasts from now. So whether that is Apple or Google or Spotify, uh, make sure that you go into that app and just search Inside EVs, hit subscribe, and then you'll get the podcast automatically every time we publish every Saturday uh, without having to uh, to go and seek it out. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and we'll get you a podcast uh, whenever we put a new one out. And on YouTube, you can hit that little bell so you get notifications. And uh, Kyle Connor, you can find him at his uh, Out of Watering out of, out of spec motoring a youtube channel and he's on twitter now as well at out of spec and um and tom you can find 
Tom on the pages of Inside EVs, and uh, on Twitter at Tomalog, T O M M L O G. T O M M O L O G. There you go. All, all right. right. Well, thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you again next week. Bye bye. See. You.